we will turn it over to Professor Marcy Morgan, who is Professor of African African American Studies, as well as the Director of the Hip Hop Archive Research Institute. So Professor Morgan, would you like to introduce our, the first fellow who's speaking in this closing series? Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, um, an honor uh, to do this introduction. I am, re you know, when you've been working in hip hop um, in various ways for years, as you see the development and the way that art gets re uh, um, defined and the contribution that hip hop itself is making to um, make sure that the, the every type of society, people, um, ideas get involved in the conversation in the way that one it happens at, as we're developing and designing the world that we're looking for. Um, at any rate, um, and I do apologize, I, uh, have on the wrong glasses. And so if it gets a little weird, uh, I'm, I'm finding my way back. Um, so it's an honor to introduce Seku Cook, uh, what, one of the NAS fellows uh, for this semester, along with Wendell Patrick. Seku is an architect, researcher, educator, and cu curator born in Jamaica and based in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's the newly appointed director of the Masters of Urban Design program at UNC Charlotte. Charlotte. Within his professional practice, a Seku Studio, Seku Cook Studio, he brings thoughtful processes and rigorous experimentation to a vast array of project types from public nonprofit uh, and residential work in New York, New Jersey, and North Carolina to mixed up projects and tenant improve, like tenant improvements in California to speculative developments locally and internationally. He holds a BA in architecture from Cornell University and M MA in architecture from Harvard and is licensed to practice architecture in New York and North Carolina. Um, as mentioned uh, above, his current research centers on the growing field of hip hop architecture, um, a theoretical movement uh, reflecting the core tenets of hip hop culture with the power to create meaningful impact on the built environment and give voice to the marginalized and unrepresented within design practice. His work is also featured in the landmark exhibition, Reconstruction, Architecture and Blackness in America at the Museum of Modern Art. This work has been widely disseminated through his writings, lectures and symposium and is the subject of his 2021 20, monograph, Hip Hop Architecture. Examining the present and future of hip hop architecture, the book explores its historical antecedents and its theory, placing it in a wider context, both within architecture and within black and African-American movements. Throughout the work is illust illustrated with inspirational case studies of architectural projects and creative practices and interspersed with individuals and interviews with key architects, designers, and academics in the field. This is a vital and provo provocative work that will appeal to architects, designers, students, theorists, and anyone interested in a fresh view of architecture, design, race, and culture. He grapples with its own race theory, race's legacy, um, he, he grapples with architects' own racist literacy. Hip hop architecture outlines a powerful new manifesto, the voice of the represented, marginalized, and voiceless within the discipline, exploring the production of spaces, buildings, and urban environments that embody the creative energies in hip hop. It is a newly expanding design philosophy which sees architecture as a distinct part of hip hop's cultural expression and which uses hip hop as a lens through which to provoke new architectural ideas. Through his research practice and other academic endeavors, Seku hopes to leave an equally lasting impact on ivory towers and underdeserved communities. 
his ultimate goal is the same as mine, actually. Mastery of craft and world domination. Say cuckoo. You can't beat that for an introduction. <laughs> Thanks, Marcy. Mastery of craft and world domination. Oh my God, that's great. Right. Mastery of craft and world domination, yeah. Thank you, um, Marcy. You're welcome. I'll see how, how far I'm getting along that goal. But um, yeah, it's, it's always interesting to see who picks up that piece in an introduction and who doesn't, who decides to leave that out. Um, but it's critical to everything that I do that, um, you know, especially in the hip hop context, you're always trying to be the best, the illest, the, the top, right? Um, so that's, that's where I'm at. Um, thanks, thanks again for that introduction, and I'm really excited to um, present some of this work here um, in this colloquium. I'm, I'm happy to and honored to be the first fellow of the series. Um, and um, as I often do, I start with an apology. This time I'm apologizing for the bookshelves in the background, which are um, incredibly empty. And, for, <laughs> and that is a bit of an embarrassment for in, a, in an office that I rarely use that I'm, I'm in right now. So please don't judge me for that. Um, so uh, yeah, so let's get into this um, hip hop architecture. Um, so I'll first start talking about hip hop architecture, not just the, the idea, but the book itself, um, the book that was finally released in April of this year, and um, that I that I um, I just sent a copy to Skip, so hopefully he's he's digging into it right now. But it's beautiful. It's a it's a beautiful book, um, brilliant argument and beautifully laid out. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, I, I it, it's it's a work that took about two two and a half years, um, but it was the culmination of about four or five years of research, um, putting it together. And it's an idea that really um, I claim no ownership of. It's an idea that was uh, sparked in the early '90s in Cornell, Cornell Architecture. Um, and uh, some of my contemporaries there were uh, the, the true pioneers of hip hop architecture. And I was lucky enough to be at Cornell at that time when the arguments were being developed and, and expanded upon. And it's a work that 20 years later, I decided to pick up again because I thought it was um, something that was incredibly relevant and timely. Um, and so now it's finally gotten put together in this book, which I feel is the culmination, a kind of marking point for the, for the, for the topic. Um, even though I continue to um, explore smaller aspects, various aspects of it um, in the rest of my work. Um, as you'll see that the, the, the forward was written by Michael Eric Dyson, um, someone who I was incredibly lucky to, um, to, to uh, get to agree to do this. Um, he, I, I literally cold called him. I, I emailed him um, and said that you know I have this this manuscript that I finished. I'd love for you to look at it and read it and tell me what you think. And he called me back in two minutes or emailed me back in two minutes and gave me his phone number to call him because he was just so blown away by the idea of hip hop architecture. And then offered himself to write the the forward without me having to ask. So. Um, here's a quick quote from that 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 um, that um, uh, uh, forward that he wrote, um, and he wrote over a thousand words, which was really, really quite generous of him. Um, but I'll I'll take you through a kind of, the kind of structure of the book um, a bit to give a grounding of of what the topic is about, and I'll also then talk about the research work that I'm going to be doing here um, or doing for this entire year um, that's looking at an aspect of it, the technology aspect of it. Um, so the project I'm working on is called 3D Turntables Remix, which is uh, an expansion of a, of a project that I had worked on a few years back. So the book is broken up into four volumes. 
um, each of which have a series of, of sections or tracks. So these are small essays that are part of the, that make up the larger volume. And then in, interspersed between those are a series of interludes. So it's really, um, I really wanted the feel of, of a kind of album, a kind of musical piece that's being put together. And also take some cues from um, from Kendrick Lamar's Dam album, which has a similar red and red, black and white, and all the the uppercase letters and the and the periods at the end of each of the the the, um, the tracks. Um, the first piece is a disclaimer, and this is this is the disclaimer that I I said was really fueled by the anger I felt after um, Skip got arrested in front of his own house, trying to get into his own house in Cambridge. Um, and it starts, uh, I'll just read the first paragraph. Um, oops, I can't see it and I can't see my cursor. Um, can't see my cursor and I can't see the thing. How do I do this without disrupting everything? Can I move it? There we go. Um, this book is not for you. It is not for architectural academic elites. It's not for those who have gentrified our neighborhoods, overly intellectualized the profession, and ignored all contemporary Black theory within the discipline. You have made architecture a symbol of exclusion, oppression, and domination, rather than expression, aspiration, and inspiration. This book is not for conformists, Black, white, or other. It is not for those who, have, who practice blind adherence to guidelines, rules, codes, and ordinances. It does not relegate itself to standard procedures for winning government contracts or gaining commissions to deliver services to clients in the 1%. And then it adds, adds um, ends. This book is not written in the journal standard third person. I am second or third to no person. Like Charlie Kaufman in adaptation, I have written myself into the script. It is written in my voice, an avatar for the voice of the people. It is not a book about my work. Indeed, it is a collection of the works and accomplishment of several participants. However, it is a book that includes samples of my work, not as an exemplar, but as a proponent of the movement. I am not a hip hop architect. I'm not even a black architect. I am an architect. And this book is for, by, and about architects, though they may define their architecture differently than you have. Um, and interspersed within here, you'll see some of these blank quotes because um, getting the rights to um, copy lyrics in a book is, is incredibly complicated. Um, but what I do, I have these blank quotes and then in the, in the footnotes, in the citations, I put the actual track name and then the time code where you can actually find the, the quote. So as you're going through the book, you can um, maybe check some of these tracks and can say, see what I'm, I'm, I'm getting at. Um, this one quote from Nas is, um, is from one of his more recent albums where it says, um, you want me to sound like everything on the top 40. I'm not for you. You're not for me. So, um, and the second volume is where most of the, the theory is laid out around hip hop architecture, the history and theory of the subject, as I say, and you can see some of these tracks here. And there are tracks that are about gender, about race, about um, commodification of hip hop, um, uh, Grids and Griot, which is, uh, which is, which is a reference to um, the, the gridded nature of, of architectural products um, as juxtaposed against the, the, the West African griot, which is a, who's a figure that kind of exists outside of the lines. And then, um, and that's actually the topic of the, the same name of the, the piece that I just did in the Chicago Architecture Biennial that I'll show very quickly um, later on. And then technology is the piece that I'll, I'll expand on um, before we get too, too far on. Um, but it starts out with legitimacy and then authenticity. So these arguments about like 
um, what is authentically hip hop are parallel to what is authentically um, architecture and finding authenticity within both worlds um, is also uh, likened to the double consciousness of, of the boys that we spoke about last week in the, in the opening colloquium. Um, and uh, in this chapter, I also um, get at the definition of what hip hop architecture is. This is something that I had um, been avoiding for a long time. I've been really resistant to defining what hip hop architecture is because that gets to something where if it can be named, then it can be owned and it can be replicated or appropriated. So um, I basically start if we understand uh, hip hop as not just a musical genre, but it's an entire culture, um, and we accept that architecture really should be about people. It should be about reflecting the social consciousness of what people have or, or people have done. Then we realize that uh, architecture of hip hop is not only possible, but necessary. Um, and this, the kind of Reader's Digest version of that definition um, was the title of this one piece where I was pressed to give a definition. And I basically said it was hip hop culture in built form. So whatever you can take from the culture and, and turn it into the built environment, that is exactly what hip hop architecture is. Um, and then in, in the book, um, not only do I insert these um, pieces of quotes from hip hop tracks or from films, um, I also have transcripts of different conversations, public conversations that have been had about hip hop architecture in um, lectures or symposia that I've put on. Um, so here's an example of, of conversation between Taya Wynn, Craig Wilkins, Andres Hernandez. These are people who have been thinking about and talking about and even writing about hip hop architecture from some time for some time. Um, the third volume is really where we get into the work, where we get into how people have speculated on what hip hop architecture might actually look like. So for anywhere from, from students to academics, to practitioners, to theorists. Um, so, and then that's broken down into um, different subcategories of just about the form, the image, the process, and then how that ultimately comes down to identity and space and urbanism being a part of, of, of how that, that work is, is manifested. And of course that urbanism is, that chapter probably is, um, has a big role in, it played a big role in getting me the position that I, that I have right now. Um, so, you know, it, it varies from work from architects collaborating with graffiti artists like this um, design for a pavilion by the European um, graffiti artist Zeds and the, um, the uh, firm, the Dutch firm uh, Mauer United Architects or work like this. This is in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where uh, an alleyway was activated by this simple line that could be seen as the graffiti writer's hand and um, amplifying some of the graffiti that was already in the alley, but making it three-dimensional and occupiable um, to work um, by architects who are drawing through not just a singular drawing in architecture, but then having that layered with many other notations and signs and then image and graffiti. Um, so layering is a process that comes, shows up quite a lot in, in hip hop architecture. Um, to work by Theaster Gates, who um, many of you may know is an artist um, and, uh, and a kind of public advocate um, in Chicago. Um, this is a work that he actually did in the UK where he used um, leftover scavenged pieces um, to take over this, this um, uh, church that had been bombed out in World War II um, to works by students. This is a work by a thesis student in UC Berkeley just a couple of years ago who did his thesis on, on hip hop and architecture and imagining um, how that all gets three-dimensionalized in terms of space and programming and use of space, but also the form of the building itself. Um, and then work by, by students of mine that I've had over the years. This is a class that I ran in 2016 in Washington, DC. 
And so students are using tools and techniques that we use in architecture school for um, diagramming and, and understanding and analyzing something. And now they're using that to break down um, break down the uh, uh, hip hop track here. It's um, Planet Rock by Africa Bambada and all the different um, samples that were used and making that graphic. And as soon as you make a graphic, then it can be a tool for creating other graphic environments, physical environments. Um, uh, similarly, uh, a graphic laid onto a, a different part of the city. And this is Adams Morgan section of Washington, DC and thinking about the movement, the coded nature of graffiti and how it can be used to um, decode different movements of different people in, this, in the city and then layered on top of each other that becomes recoded and um, um, illegible. But then there's a new legibility that happens three-dimensionally when those um, coded surfaces now become street furniture or an amphitheater tables and, and chairs and so forth and benches. Um, um, and then the, the fourth volume is uh, where um, I look at different speculations, tangents and things that may be related to hip hop and architecture but aren't exactly hip hop and architecture. Um, so most of these are, are architectural movements that um, bear some relationship like deconstructivism, Afrofuturism, informal settlements, activist architecture, and what I'm calling neo-postmodernism. And, um, and each of these has either a formal or procedural um, aspect that relates to some of the things that I've been talking about in the previous volumes um, uh, about of hip hop architecture. Um, and then Kanye is the only person who gets his own his own chapter in the book. Um, he's a he's a fascinating figure, as we all know. But he um, this is a picture from when he he visited us at Harvard GSD, um, and uh, this was in October of 2013. Um, and uh, this was the result of of us as an African American student union writing to him to engage with him. On, on talk with him about architecture because he had recently been cited in the press as being inspired by architects as working with five architects at a time hiring architects to work in Donda his design practice. Um, and uh, we were fascinated by the fact that he is a, a huge figure in the hip hop world, but could have this powerful influence in in the architectural world just by his presence and what he's, he talks about. And the chapter goes on to talk about how he actually operates, not dissimilarly to um, some of the, the principles of large architecture firms where he directs the projects without having to actually engage in the, the design, you know, the, 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 the physical drawing or the physical um, uh, imaging of, of these spaces, but he's heavily involved in all of these processes, just like an architect would be. And so if a, if a hip hop icon is involved in producing architecture, is that by, by default hip hop architecture? This is um, one of the open questions that's in the book. Um, and then this is an example of, of, of um, deconstructivism. Um, this is a building that's quite famous by Frank Gehry in Bilbao in Spain, but it's also the backdrop of a, of a music video, a Jermaine Dupri and Mariah Carey music video. Um, and then Af uh, Afrofuturism is this movement of like really in, uh, in imagining what, what the future of Africa looks like for, in a physical way. This is an image from a show um, at, at MoMA by Bodis, Bodis Isaac uh, Kingeles. And um, if you're imagining, um, if you've seen Black Panther and you saw the images of Wakanda, that's a really great embodiment of what Afrofuturism looks like in, in the architectural world. And then um, uh, informal settlements or, um, you know, informal settlements, uh, uh, part of that chapter is about this, this project that where the architect basically designs half of the project and allows the people to then fill in the rest of the project themselves. Um, and how there is a kind of innate 
way that people know how to create and shape their own spaces without um, an architect or a designer from top down dictating exactly what that should be. Um, and in the piece on, on neo-postmodernism, I'm looking at some contemporary younger uh, practitioners who don't necessarily identify within hip hop culture or identify within um, minority races, but they definitely are using tools of hip hop like sampling and remixing and mashing up. So this is, these are the, this is how they describe their own work where they're sampling pieces of other buildings and mashing them up together and recomposing them into new, new forms. Um, so um, that's, so um, humanizing architectural technology is um, uh, the beginning of some of that extrapolating in the, the, the technology section of the book where I'm looking at, um, at, uh, at the DJ as really the first hackers of technology, right? The hip hop DJ and um, it, this whole research starts with this quote from Harry Allen that uh, um, who, you know, um, someone is a colleague of mine now who I've been talking to for a few years. Actually, just before he he was also named a, a Nas Hip Hop Fellow a few years ago. So you should all be really familiar with him. Um, but we talk about hip hop humanizes technology and makes it tactile. Um, and I'm really interested in this power of hip hop to make technology tactile. And um, just by taking technology and making it do stuff that it isn't supposed to do. So um, this is the, the, the premise that I start out um, in understanding hip hop technology. And again, understanding this idea of, of, of hip hop producers and DJs literally hacking every single part of, of the technology that I had access to, to produce uh, a sonic landscape. Right, so um, this whole setup is fascinating to me. All of these things were pieces that they were gathered from all these different areas. Even the fan is something that was necessary that wasn't really made to, to cool down equipment. It was made to cool down people. And then, um, but it all starts with this very simple gesture of doing the one thing you're never supposed to do with a record, which is putting your finger on it. And that translates the, the, the record player from a, from a static consumption device into now a musical instrument. And that translation from consumption device to musical instrument is an incredibly powerful transposition that I really wanna get at the heart of and that I've been experimenting with in my own research. Uh, of course, Jay Dilla, you know, we can't leave him out of the equation um, because he not only did that with the turntables, but with other digital um, inputs like the drum machines. Um, so the next is I'll play a little video clip um, that might um, clarify a little bit more of this attitude. So let's talk about Jay Dilla's drum style first. He figured out how to humanize the drum machine by avoiding certain things that he could have done to make it more robotic, make it more stiff. For instance, the MPC has this incredibly useful tool called quantization. What quantizing does is it takes your performance, let's say I'm playing my drum pattern. And when I'm playing it, sometimes it's a little ahead, it's a little bit behind. If your kick drums are off by a little bit, quantization snaps them in place. And so a lot of producers, they use quantize, not as a crutch, but just they just weren't thinking about not using it. And so Dilla was like, yeah, I'm just going to turn this off. The result is a discography full of incredibly off-kilter drums. This loose drumming style was incredibly influential. So um, another example of this that, that I talk about, this non-quantization, that Dilla did um, is uh, in this track, Baby. I, I write about it in the book. Um, and he basically takes, um, takes the sample of, of, of uh, this Motown group saying maybe, 
and makes it sound like baby and then it's kind of behind it's kind of and it's kind of chopped up in different ways so maybe you can listen to it and and pick out just the word baby and see how it shows up so you hear sometimes it's all the way there sometimes it happens a little bit earlier sometimes it gets cut off um and it's just that that loose style really takes something that could be completely mechanical and digital and makes it very very human um the other uh, thesis, part of the thesis comes from Amiri Baraka, his, his description of a typewriter, which I still find incredibly fascinating that it's this, um, you know, um, the way that, um, that, uh, that Black authors, Black thinkers, or Black producers of, uh, and Black artists think about technology isn't the same way as it, as it was really used to produce you know he's talking about here um why should it just be this thing that it's only um using the, the tips of our fingers um if i were creating a, a machine that's an expression scriber if you will then you the kind of instrument i would step or sit or sprawl or hang use not only my fingers but make words express feelings but elbows feed head behind and all the sounds i wanted screams grunts taps itches right so he's really just kind of blowing up this idea that a, a device should be that static or we should have such limited um limited um uh interaction with that device in order to express oneself and and you know a typewriter is corny right um, so that's kind of the, the premise behind 3D turntables. Um, and uh, so the original research was funded by, partially funded by Autodesk Education. And um, I, it started with some experiments in a class that I taught, a seminar class that I taught at Syracuse. Um, and thinking about how to hack some of these digital fabrication tech, um, technologies that we have available in architecture, like. 3D printers and laser cutters to start out with. So for ex example, these are some, some experiments that one pseudo student did by taking a 3D printer and in the software, um, basically when you 3D print something, the software automatically calculates the, um, the uh, support material that's needed to produce the, the, the object that's being printed. So that, you know, because if you're printing layer by layer, some of it's going to sag, some of it's going to fall off. So you need to produce this support material for this object to be printed successfully. So um, this, was, this was answering the question, what happens if you reduce that support material to the bare minimum? What do you get? So you get these things that are really rough really irregular really uh, you get these wispy things we're also using a very cheap 3d printer to amplify some of the most basic qualities of it um, and then another uh, set of experiments by another student using the laser cutter and if you're familiar with what a laser cutter does it just takes really flat two-dimensional materials has a laser and cuts it in two dimensions um, so this experiment started out with the idea of what if we, we laser cut non-planar materials, right? So now these, you have the, the material that's folded and crushed up on the left-hand side or folded and, and rigid on the right. And then you get these really weird effects of the, the, the laser cutting through these folds or cutting through um, not being able to focus on a very specific area. So now it creates this, this feathered brush stroke like um, effect. Um, so that was the beginning and, and the student cataloged all the different effects that she was able to produce. Um, and so that got, um, that spawned some in, more independent research that I did the summer after that, where we took these cheap printers, these are, about $250 3D printers, the cheapest that you can get. Um, the great thing is that we could do whatever we wanted with them. We could buy a bunch of them and, and start messing around with them. Um, the main drawback is that um, they, they, they get clogged really easily. So they do break, but not for the reason that we, we use them for. Um, 
So in my studio for the whole summer, we had a bunch of these 3D printers going at the same time. Um, just, but we were really interested in how can we disrupt the process of the 3D printer um, doing what it's doing. So again, um, uh, the Harry Allen quote, hip hop, um, taking things and making it do, taking technology, making technology do what it's not supposed to do. So we start out with these primitives of a cube. That's what it's supposed to print out. And we would draw it each time just as a, as a reference point. And then by shifting the nozzle, so as the, the print is coming out, we're literally shifting the nozzle and disrupting the process. And now it creates these, these shifted tiered pieces and then we would draw that or we would shift the bed. So, um, you know, the basic way that a 3D printer works is that, or this 3D printer works is that the bed moves in the X, Y direction, the nozzle moves in the X, Z direction, and then the, the, the bed lifts in the, in the Z direction, right? Um, and so if you disrupt the bed or if you disrupt the nozzle, then you're gonna not get the same cube that you're trying to get out. You're gonna get these other shifted random things that used to be a cube, and now it doesn't look like a cube. Another thing is that it, 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 you can turn on the fill material only and you get results like this, or you can turn on the, the, the shell material only, which is the outline of the cube and you get um, other results like this, right? Um, and then we also invented this other process for a spin so we realized that um, you could actually um, not just disrupt it by moving a nozzle, but we could actually like create another bed that we can turn while the printer is going. And so now we're getting these spinning motions from the same cube primitive that we're trying to print out. We have to use a metal sheet because, um, because of the heat that it needed to adhere to the, the surface. So these are some of the experiments we would get out of that, right? Using the shell and the fill only. And then the crossfade is from that first image where we had the three printers going at the same time and they would print cubes that were similar, but a little bit off it would, in different colors and then print them on top of each other, you know, interrupt the process halfway through and then um, switch, switch one plate to the next to then get these other results. And then we would catalog it in terms of a, a whole matrix of things. And, um, and then, you know, where this goes, we, we start to think about um, other ideas like um, uh, printing, 3D printing uh, buildings. So this is work by Rael Sanfratello um, out on the West Coast who have been using um, uh, Adobe as a, as a material to go through an extruder and have this life, this building size 3D printer that's printing these buildings. Um, and they've done really beautiful work. Or they have, they also work, they, they, they've experimented with 3D printing more than almost any other designers that I know of. Um, and it could be the other end where you, you are 3D printing components in this disrupted fashion and then aggregating them together to create uh, a space. Um, the, the third way was thinking about um, how uh, we could use this as um, a process to then prototype what a building might look like, a different process that's happening that's not necessarily a 3D printing process. So uh, we apply this to a couple of buildings that were on uh, the south side of Syracuse that were um, quite dilapidated, uh, maybe slated for demolition. Um, and then use that as the primitive instead of the cube, and then did the same experiments. We would draw them first and then um, start to shift them, break them up, chop them, spin them, and then we'd get um, results like this. And I can see the fill now becomes, um, the fill and the shell are very different from each other. The, the fill, the support material now becomes a graphic part of the whole composition. Um, and so, yeah, these are some of the printed experiments that we get out of that. 
And then of course, putting together a whole matrix to understand where this all um, lies, um, trying to be as scientific about it as possible. And, and then using some of the stories, the historical photographs as this thing that gets revealed when, um, when you shift and, and cut and slice. Because part of the thing that, that happens in when a DJ is doing their mixing, they're really um, revealing um, pieces of, of musical history that may have been lost or samples that people may have forgotten that they want to bring back. So these are some of the images of the proposal and it's, and it's kind of seen as um, a way of demolishing a building in a performative way. So the demolition is now a performance that becomes a temporary asset to a community as it's, as it's, as it's um, coming down. And some of this ideology is going to be um, applied to a, a project that I'll be starting pretty soon for the DC Housing Authority, where um, they have a, a housing project that's going to be coming down in the next couple of years, but we'll get a chance to design and, and um, repurpose it and, and have it um, be a public, a public, um, publicly accessible space. Um, so there are a few extrapolations from this this work that I'll I'll wrap up with. Um, so uh, this is a project that I recently that I designed uh, earlier this year or end of last year. Um, it's for the, the the city of Los Angeles, um, the LA DBS, the Department of Building and Safety they um, started a program where they, um, uh, they're designing ADUs, which are accessory dwelling units. So to, in, a, in a way to densify Los Angeles, they basically got rid of single family uh, zoning, which means that every lot that has a single family house on it can have a secondary lot in the back or in the side to have as an accessory unit that people can rent out or, um, or occupy in different ways. And they created a, a, a program, a standard plan program where designers would have one plan that's, that's been, um, that they've designed that can be replicated multiple times. So it's kind of shortening the, uh, the approval process. So this, this plan gets approved by the city and then someone can purchase the, the plan and then build it. Um, it's been on the market since uh, the spring. And I think I just sold the first one. And interestingly enough, um, it's being sold to uh, uh, Tunji Balogun, who's just got announced as the, the new CEO of Def Jam Records. So um, it'd be an interesting connection between the work that he's doing and building this project. project. But you can see, it's formally, the process isn't the same. It's just thick construction, it's regular construction, but the formal language of it is similar to that other product that I just showed. Um, and then this project um, is similar in terms of its process, even though the use is very different. This is the project that I just completed in Chicago for the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, so it's just a site, uh, 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 an empty site that is owned by and being used by um, a local community organization. And um, yeah, so there's this existing shipping container that's there um, that they have been using to store bicycles. And then I bring an, a, a second identical shipping container that got chopped up into different pieces, but now becomes in its open state becomes a space for um, for, for benches, for planter beds, for performances, and for additional storage and for retail. So um, this, is, this is just a couple of quick images of the final piece as it looks in the, on, on the site um, that we can talk about separately. Um, uh, and then um, some of the work was, I had a, a residence um, that started uh, a couple of years ago with um, the Autodesk Bill space in Boston, but obviously that's, that had been closed down for over a year and I won't be traveling to Boston for this fellowship, but I was very interested in using some of their robotics there, but 
I'll be using some similar facilities that we have here in, in Charlotte. Um, we don't have the massive 3D printer, that orange cube that's in the bottom left, um, but we do have some robot arms that we can use. Um, and so this is the last image, um, which is really the um, place where I'll talk about the work in progress, the kind of speculations of the things that I want to experiment with and I've started experimenting with this, this semester, this year. Um, uh, so first off, we're going to um, replicate some of the previous experiments with the 3D printer and um, another experiment with a laser cutter um, and, and think about um, other places, other soft spots in some of these uh, production processes where we can hack, where we can use it in a way that it's not supposed to be used and, and think about the, the, uh, the kind of, um, the kind of uh, spaces and architectures that can be created from that. Um, but then this is a secondary experiment, which I'm kind of excited about. It's something that I've been thinking about for a number of years. Um, but hadn't really had the space and time to explore, explore it until now. So thinking about the interface between analog inputs and digital outputs um, so that we can think about the, the um, so Arduino technology is something that's really quite fascinating that I'm just learning about now. Um, and it's a way of having analog inputs to create digital outputs through these um, uh, robotic technological pieces. So through the Arduino technology, I want to hack that to allow for turntables. So turntable movements to then feed into the computer to then either to produce either, you know, one of these three different products. So either within the computer space, the digital space in the center there, um, manipulating three-dimensional spaces through the our three-dimensional modeling program. So, um, so the turntables and the equalizer and the um, and the slide are 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 um, literally in real time um, transforming the digital space that's on the screen. Right, um, that's the goal of of the project. The second tangent to the top is um, a much more developed version of that, where you're not just transforming the, the digital space on the, on the screen, but you would have an actual space that then is on um, hydraulics of some sort. And the inputs are, are controlling the hydraulics that would actually change the shape and nature of that space as you are live mixing it. And there are different kinds of inputs that could, that could control that. And then the bottom part is, is, is a robot arm. And um, so imagine a turntable being the thing that's controlling a robot arm that can then produce different kind of um, uh, uh, physical or spatial things in the world. Um, so these are really early ideas and things that I'm hoping to get deeper into this year. So. That's where I'm at. Thanks. Wow, thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Gee, Wes, it's, um, I mean, you're brilliant, man. <laughs> <laughs> that means a lot coming from you, Skip. No, no, I'm serious. That's just uh, um, fascinating. I'm, uh, Dwight, looking at some of those buildings, I felt like I'd stepped into a three-dimensional version of Sun Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, Ramel Z is also uh, another figure who I'm fascinated by, and and who I've written a little bit about in the in the book. So, questions, comments. Um, as I said to Seiko, um, we're co-hosting the a big conference on eugenics, and Harvard has a, uh, a a deep and nefarious connection to the history of eugenics in America. So, I have to be online at one. So when I disappear, believe me, it's not out of lack of interest in, uh, in this presentation. So I apologize in advance to everyone like I apologize to Seiko. But questions, um, comments? I think Abby wanted to ask something before, because I know she has to disappear at one as well. 
No, I didn't want to ask. It was it was fascinating. And um, we actually, the Kingalas piece that you showed or the yep. exhibition that you showed in our first um, exhibition at the Cooper Gallery, his mm -hmm. work was really central to it and kind of the entire exhibition radiated out from that and this idea of the African city. So, mm -hmm. but congratulations, it was it was great work. And I do have to leave, you're right. <laughs> so, but uh, going where Skip is going right now, but it was fantastic, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Wendell. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Okay, yeah, that was, that was wonderful. It's, it's really great as, um, you know, as a hip hop aficionado to see how different people envision hip hop and how it affects their, not only their lives, but their individual practice. And so, um, yeah, it's really fascinating. And I definitely look forward to having more discussions about, you know, some, some ways that we can collaborate or if I can be helpful in any way, just in terms of moving your project forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a question for you. Uh, sure. Where, where in Jamaica did you go to school? <laughs> I went to Monroe, Monroe College up in the mountains. Okay. Crazy boarding school up there. Okay. I was a, I'm a Campionite. So. Oh, for work? Oh, geez. I didn't know you were Jamaican. Yep. Half Jamaican, half Trinidadian. Oh, wow. See, so we had, have to have the two Jamaicans in the hip, in, <laughs> as the hip hop scholar. But the, the relationship between Jamaica and hip hop culture is something that I've been fascinated by as well for a long time. And, um, and uh, I, I touch on it a little bit in the, in the, um, in the book um, that, you know, the origins, you know, um, Cool Herc is, is Jamaican. He talks about this kind of revelation he had when he was visiting Jamaica and saw the big sound systems and he saw all of the, you know, the DJs um, you know, toasting on the mic and calling out to people and, and brought that back to the Bronx. And, um, and yeah, like Jamaican music is deeply embedded within the hip hop sonic landscape. And um, there's a really, really tight connection between the two and always has been. Um, but, but yeah, I also, um, my, my, my sister went to Campion, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, but thank you so much for that. It's really great. Look forward to talking more. Yeah, for sure. Adulu. Oh, thank you, Seku. Uh, I really appreciate your colloquium. So thank you so much for that. And indeed, you are you you are you are very good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I you were talking about uh, some as I understood too, huh? some uh, ideas connected with the uh, hip hop architecture and related to art. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know that I've been trained, you may have know, noticed that during for my first presentation, my former presentation that I'm, I've been trained in philosophy and especially in philosophy of art and aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So this was very fascinating for me and very in interesting. I would like to, as a philosopher, I'm, I'm interested in the most theoretical aspect of yeah. people's work. So I would like to draw you back if you want to some for of the sure. theoretical aspects of, of uh, what you did. So um, first of all, I would, I would like to have some uh, explanation, some further explanation about your relationship. I mean, your controversial relationship with uh, the, the definition. <laughs> Why don't you want to describe or to define hip hop mm -hmm. architecture? Because definition is not all, um, not as rigorous as you may have, uh, yeah. as you may have uh, I, an idea of it. So maybe there will be a good uh, reason for you not to define, and maybe also it re it may be uh, related to a kind of a strict, too strict uh, and rigorous yeah. uh, idea of uh, what the definition is. As you have, as you pointed, you you have been able at least to define it uh, in, in in some sense. So, so that. You can define without being so rigorous, without being so strict. And I would like to yeah. uh, like to elaborate a little bit about uh, this yeah. uh, controversial relation. So that's the first point. Uh, I have another point, if 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 you want. The, sure. You want me to answer the, the first relation. one first? <laughs> oh, you want to? You want you want me? To, you want us to have a dialogue? You, oh, yeah. No, go ahead. No, keep going. Keep going. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So 
The second point is about the relation of what I've seen, especially the works of art that you have been, I've been, um, we, we, we watch during uh, your presentation and the concerning of uh, volume two and volume three of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, especially what I've noticed is the kind of uh, uh, work on the color, the work on the color on the, many of the works of art I've, I've seen. So I wanted to ask, what is the relation uh, between what I've seen, uh, what you showed us and the, the pop culture? Mm -hmm. And this question is not naive because talking about pop culture, I wanted to relate uh, to draw you back to this uh, uh, confrontation or the collaboration between Andrew Warhol and uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. It is very idea of the commodification you have been trying to criticize if I, uh, I got, you, yeah. got you right. Yeah. So what are your, how is this work, the work you showed us and your personal research connected to this idea of pop culture I have been able to, to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And by asking the question of cult pop culture, as I'm saying, this is not a naive question because it relates mm -hmm. to another concept you have, you have been raising since the, 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 we started all the colloquium. Mm -hmm. It's this question of uh, authenticity. Mm -hmm. And talking about the authenticity, I, I, I'm not, I don't know if you are aware of the work of uh, Busti Bulaga. He's a famous Cameroonian philosopher. He died a couple of years ago. And he said that, uh, our future, and I'm quoting, is not to be situated in the past of the other. So when I'm relating this, this work, this particular work, the work on the color, relating to the pop culture, this idea of Afrofuturism, which to my eyes appear like the work of Roy Lichtenstein and Saul Lewitt, put in 3D, but without the drawing, I'm, I'm interested in where do you put this question of authenticity, since you have been concerned with this idea of uh, authenticity. Mm -hmm. And the last point, I hope this, I'm not <laughs> disturbing too much. And the last point is uh, maybe a suggestion. I don't know uh, if you are aware of the work of Agnès Guéraud, he's a French philosopher. He published like uh, five years, four years ago, uh, uh, a book uh, in, uh, entitled Dialectic of Pop, in which he was, uh, she's advocating for a, a better consideration of uh, this street, this kind of art that is doing at the margin of the mainstream uh, and so and such and stuff like that. So I think that may be interesting, maybe to have a look at that work if that is uh, not the, the case. Okay, so uh, that was we asked a couple yeah. of questions and yeah, can you, suggestions. Can Thank you me. give me the, the 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 name of the? The book again? I can put it on the chat because yeah, I know please. that many people are not using my accent. <laughs> please, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, on the first point about definition, I think it's pretty simple that I'd been really early on confronted by, um, especially in the architecture world, people wanting to relegate it to the the realm of style, right? They they want to say, you know. Um, if I see a hip hop building, will I know it? <laughs> like, what does it look like, right? Um, and can you point me, can you give me an example of a building that is hip hop architecture? And um, to me, that is um, a really asinine question that doesn't really get to the point of what hip hop architecture is because it's much more about process and identity. It's about who you're working with, how you're working with them and for and why. And, and what does that reveal about your identity? And, um, and the exhibition that I did in 2018 that is still traveling now, it was first to answer that question of what does it look like? And uh, the resounding um, uh, conclusion is that it doesn't look like any one thing. It, it looks like many, many things, just like hip hop music can sound like many things and hip hop fashion can be many, many things and hip hop dance can be many, many things. And, um, and that's also related to the commodification question. It's like, if, if I know the rules of this style, now I can go and replicate that style. If I can name it, then I can own it. And if I can own it, I can make a lot of money off of it. I can appro appropriate it. And we know that we live in a tri trickle up economy. So anybody who 
who, if anybody's making money, it's going to be the same people who've always made money off of it. So not the people who are actually producing it. So the definition question is really, really, really important is that I am not the sole arbiter of what is hip hop architecture and what's not hip hop architecture. I'm giving a framework for people to find themselves within. So um, people want to know, um, you know, like I, I come across these people sometimes where it's like, yeah, um, I'm an architect and I do Tudor houses. I'm like, how the fuck can you do Tudor houses? You're not a Tudor, right? You, you're replicating what you think a Tudor house looks like using contemporary materials that have nothing to do with the Tudors whatsoever, right? Um, it's, it's, it's like, I don't want anybody to just say, okay, this is hip hop architecture. Now I'm gonna go out and produce something. It's, 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 it's ridiculous. So, um, and then the, the second point about the, um, about, uh, about the pop, pop culture, um, uh, I think this process is definitely deeply embedded within pop culture. And in the, the chapter on commodity and commodity, I talk about how, you know, the relationship between hip hop and, um, and, uh, and capitalism and how, um, you know, um, hip hop has always been really invested in the capitalist, the capitalist model, but operating within it in a, in a different kind of way, right? So understanding that, um, that it's, 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 it's using capitalist models to, to completely subvert the notion of capitalism and, um, and uh, creating commodities out of things that, that shouldn't be commodities. And then at the same time being commodified um, in ways that are not are not super useful or helpful, but each time it gets commodified, it changes itself, it redefines itself and becomes something else. So um, hip hop has always been on the cutting edge of pop culture, always been defining itself in, in, in many ways and redefining itself. Um, so, so yeah, like I, I'm also interested and fascinated by the, the, um, the Basquiat and um, and um, and Andy Warhol conversation because that gets at the heart of this commodification of pop culture. Um, the color in the project, I don't know if it relates as much to pop culture. I think color is um, expressive. Color is about identity, and color may have more to do with affect than than with um, a kind of pre-calculated determinism of what color should be and how it should be used. Um, yeah, and then um, uh, 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 authentic. So um, I think one can be authentic and still um, be commodified if you know that the, your authenticity doesn't de depend on being commodified, right? Um, I think people sell themselves in ways that where they understand that what I'm selling is a version, a kind of caricature of myself but I can still maintain myself, um, which is why, you know, uh, Trisha Rose talks about all the names of all the, the rappers that, that rappers take on and, talk, you know, it's always like um, big this or, or supreme this or, you know, um, that king and that queen. And it's like these, these, these grandiose um, uh, images that they're creating of themselves where they know that there's, they're not that person. It's like they're, but they're still authentic, right? There's still an authenticity to be had within there. Um, and yeah, the last point, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely look up that that philosopher. Sure. Thanks. Hope I hate <laughs> all of that, uh, Catherine. <laughs> Sure. Thanks. Um, and and Kate works just just fine. Um, I'm I'm also quaking in my boots, uh, you know, tremoring at your your multidisciplinary brilliance. It was such an amazing moment to get to know your work. So thank you for sharing it in such a sort of wide ranging way, both the published work and the work that's coming down the pike. Um, and thank you also for like reminding us of the moral stakes in play in um, acts of definition as claims to empowerment. Um, I wondered a lot about your, the part of your talk where you're talking about hip hop um, technology is tactile. 
Mm -hmm. um, partly just coming from sort of STS and kind of its field. I was curious if you could riff. What is for STS? Sorry. Uh, Science, technology, and society. It's a sort of interdisciplinary subfield, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of work. Okay, well, I guess that was sort of my question. I was wondering if you were familiar, sort of, with some of the work that's been done on um, music technology in that field. Um, it it's a field that I don't think always takes race very seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, there would be much you could contribute to conversations in this field. I'm happy to like send some citations separately. Uh, but one of the things that, one of the points you were sort of taking up was this, it's framed for that field as sort of users and the fact that users matter and the, the sort of tinkering and the, and the sort of um, complexity of use and reuse and appropriation for alternative uses and stuff like that um, has been taken up really productively in scholarship on technology um, kind of in science, but especially for you, technology in um, in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and I could share some citations there mm -hmm. as well. Um, Kapitan yeah. Mubunga at MIT might be an interesting sort of person to kind of read around. He theorizes um, the use of uh, technology in Africa and kind of its capaciousness in, in ways that I think are, are potentially interesting or productive for you if you wanted to kind of link in with some of those conversations. Yeah. Not that you need to to have an amazing project, <laughs> um, but it just, it resonated with me so much from the work that's going on, the conversations being had um, in STS in Africa against a kind of STS that's um, coming from a kind of global north and um, happy to share sites or just hear you think about those concepts or problems if, if you feel like you're up to it. Yeah, for sure. I'd, I'd love to hear um, as much about that as possible and, and see and put some of it on my reading list. Um, yeah, the, the, um, the relationship between technology and, and sociology, I think, is critical to the project. Um, like how people use and adapt technology is critical. Um, and and the, 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 um, the racial component to that as well, like how um, different peoples um, respond to technology in different ways, or even like um, a few years ago, there was this thing about the 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 um, the racist like um, hand washing machines, <laughs> like it wouldn't pick up black skin, it would only pick up white skin, and it's like there's a kind of default nature of how we approach almost everything in this country that you know whiteness as a kind of default and um, and uh, or or Kodak film um, um, kind of being calibrated towards whiteness and, and not really um, um, being able to represent blackness in any clear way. Um, those are smaller technological things, but I'm much more interested in, in how it's used and how it can be adapted and how it can, um, and it's very adaptation as a signifier of cultural, um, you know, cultural uh, 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 imperatives, right? Um, that, that um, you know, um, uh, so, and, and interestingly enough, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely like a, a Mac versus a PC. So I'm, I'm on the side of, of, uh, of predetermined um, technological space versus the open source. Uh, world of Google and 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 Microsoft and um, it, like but but there's a difference there between things that are intentionally open source versus um, versus things that are um, become open source by subversive means right and approaching something that's intentionally not open source and then turning it on, on its head that's what I'm most interested in right. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Celine. Still still muted. There you go. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's a very profound and uh, compelling way to, to think of architecture and the link between hip hop culture. Uh, I have maybe a naive question, but when I heard you, I was wondering if you had, I, I guess so, links with DJs and rappers, and how do they do they know your work and uh, how do they react to your proposition of, of, about the impact of hip hop culture on 
you urbanism and also architecture yeah um <laughs> that's the point in my career that i'm still waiting for <laughs> and i'm hoping that this this fellowship is a step in that direction i've already gotten skipped to 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 read my book i've gotten michael eric dyson to read and write the forward to the book um it's just one step closer to to nas and and jay-z and <laughs> and and people like that where um but you know it, it's it's part of a, a larger um conversation that um that I think is problematic and, and gets me in trouble sometimes where it's like uh, there is um, so much money and attention and so much um, cultural capital that that is that that um, is um, that's controlled by people in the hip hop world. Um, and I'll probably also put professional athletes in that. <laughs> in that in that um space because um you know you know their their criticism is uh, the criticism that comes their way is constantly like what are you doing for the people what are you doing for the spaces where you came from what are you how are you helping um which is not really fair all the time like not everybody who made it out of poverty into into wealth has has to directly um you know, monetarily support everybody that, that that they passed along on their way up. Um, and I'm sure they are philanthropic in, in many, many ways. Um, but when it comes to design, I think there's such a power um, in terms of who you hire. You know, this is not who you're donating money to or who your charitable causes are. It's like, are, like it, there's like this aspiration for um, really um really cheap really bad european like european architecture um because and and i don't blame them for that that's what they're programmed to to like that's what they're programmed to think right it's like you know you grew up in the slums and you see the big mansion down the road down the way it's like that's what i want to get to that's what i want to get at um so the idea that there could be a completely different perspective of architecture that actually reflects your own ideals, your own ways of thinking, that's that's completely new. Like this, like doing this um, this ADU for for um, for Tunji is is potentially a really powerful thing. Like he now is he he didn't pick the 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 white box version of the ADU. He picked the one that was about hip hop. And he was like, yes, this is the one that I want to commission. This is the one that I want to build. And that could be potentially uh, an inroads into into more spaces, you know, within Def Jam and within whoever else it comes along. But um, but yeah, like uh, and and I've had you know ways of getting you know I've had like one degree of separation to Kanye for many many years, but it's never you know never been more than just that. And um, and yeah. Um, yeah, and, and and you know, I'm just hoping to get the book in Nas's hands since since I have a fellowship that bears his, bears his name. So we'll see. Yeah, Tadiwa. Hi, thank you so much. This is so fascinating, and I was curious to hear a little bit more about the intergenerational aspects of your work. I thought it was fascinating that you started this like in the 90, in the 90s of Cornell having those conversations and then you return to it and there seems to be a lot of um, like your students presentations as well. And so there seems to be a politics with like the concept of the loose style that I think would lend itself well to having intergenerational conversations or mm -hmm. collaborations that are not as hierarchical as thinking about like a tradition where the hip hop architecture starts at point <laughs> X. So I was just curious if if there are like very different styles with different generations or if there have been interesting intergenerational collaborations that um, you've had. And also, I guess um, I was interested in the intergenerational question because the 
um, your presentation had more emphasis on like turntables and that sort of iconic technology and each, you know, I, I mean, I'm just thinking about how I fucked up my like record player <laughs> two seconds ago because I have no idea how to use it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's different like emotional connotations and things like that with technologies for different generations in terms of like what how if they they have a nostalgic relationship to it or a more like immediate relationship to it and how they like play with the technology and that kind of stuff so i was just curious in in um your project what your experience has been with um students or with kind of older practitioners yeah um i i um i think <laughs> At the heart of that question is the reality that I'm kind of stuck in the 90s. <laughs> like my entire, you know, most of my my hip hop, um, my hip hop uh, kind of um, grounding is between 1994 and 2006, right? Um, so, um, and I think most people have a kind of era of hip hop that they more identify with than others. And yeah, it, it's 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 a way of of um, grounding yourself. But um, um, yeah, in terms of the question of intergenerationality, I think that's another kind of um, caveat or flavor to hip hop architecture that I haven't yet um, been um, able to to really um, bring into the work because for many years, you know, people who get it really immediately are saying that, oh, okay, so what about different regions, you know, you know, Southern hip hop and West Coast hip hop and, you know, Texas, whatever is happening down there is very different from this East Coast rap stuff. And it's very different. Or um, the idea that the technology, the turntablism is something that's kind of in a bucket that's different from what contemporary producers do or if you just look at Wendell's setup like he's you know there's a, there's a whole you know treasure trove of technological like analog and digital technologies that produce music now um, that's very different from turntablism and then there's like the global the global aspect of it like hip-hop in Korea is very different than hip-hop in South Africa or, or Brazil or Germany um, and yeah, and I think some of those questions can start to be answered later. I think right now it was really very important for me to get the book out because that, okay, this is ground zero, right? This is the establishing moment. This is how we start. And then from here, we can get to these other pieces that, uh, um, that we can get to. So yeah, the intergenerational aspect is really, really interesting to me that, you know, the stuff from you know, the stuff from when hip hop first started to be recorded in the in like 79, 80 to the stuff in the early 90s to the stuff in the 2000s to, to right now, it's all very, very, very different. Um, but we're still talking about the musical genre and not the cultural phenomenon. So the cultural phenomenon has gone through different transformations as well. Um, so I'm more interested in how that has changed and how the music has changed and the music is kind of a marker of those cultural transitions. Um, but again, that's like a, another project that's, that's, you know, later on, maybe. Thanks. Uh, Jim, I think was next. Thanks, Saku. That was, that was really good. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good, good. That really was very enjoyable. And and really got me thinking about a lot of different things. Uh, and I won't promise not to ask you about all of them because I could go on for a long time as my students can attest. But, um, you know, I guess it's a cultural historian in me, but I was wondering how you see your work and not only just your work, but you know, what your, your idea of a, of a hip hop architecture, how you see it also relating to earlier forms of, of black, public art, even black architecture, someone like Max Bond, who was also trying to think about some of the issues that you were thinking about even in the 60s, in mm -hmm. the 70s, you know, sort of as just before hip hop or as hip hop was, was growing or something like the Wall of Respect, which was in Chicago, which was kind of like a guerrilla thing, right? They didn't mm -hmm. ask the owner, they, they did it. They talked to the, uh, 
Blackstone Rangers, they talked to the neighborhood. So, and, and that was a way of configuring, reconfiguring a kind of a space. Do, so do you see a connection to that? Do you draw that kind of, I mean, now I have to buy your book and read it and then, <laughs> but uh, do you see a kind of connection to that way that those, those sort of folks? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, and I do talk about it a bit in the book for sure. Um, you know, in the section on Godfathers and on um, nostalgia, I talk about about those pieces definitely in the second volume. But it's it's um, and the 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 way that I approach it, you know, people like Max Bond and and um, and uh, you know, so, so there there are people like Max Bond or Paul Revere Williams or. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, Harry Cobb, who were like really leading architects who um, happened to be black and who were doing really good work for a long time and um, distinguished themselves as, as successful architects, despite the fact that they were black, um, who were not especially seeking um, blackness in their design. Um, some, some were working for Black communities quite heavily, um, like, um, uh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting his name, who did a lot of work in DC, DC, DC housing. But, um, you know, but the, the, the work itself, the design framework was not our surrounding Blackness, right? It was, um, it was really, um, from one point of view, working on um, contemporary um, contemporary interpretations of of European styles of of architecture, but doing it well and doing it for Black communities, which is one thing. And then there are others like David Hughes and um, and Jack Travis, who've literally been trying to find Blackness within architecture and define Blackness in architecture. Um, and they've done it through trying to deter, trying to um, advocate for uh, an Afrocentrism, an Afrocentrist aesthetic within architecture. Um, and what they have gotten to, the problem with what they've done from my point of view is that they've centered the continent much more and tried to replicate um, images of, of, of what, the, what is identified as African. So using things like kinte cloths as patterns or thinking about um, some of the Africanist materials and trying to apply them. Um, and um, yeah, there is um, maybe an Afrocentric image that we can identify with, with popular culture but it's really an American, it's like seen through an American lens. It's like an American lens of what Africa, the continent is, which is really, really, we all know in this room how, how diverse Africa is as a place, probably the most diverse place on earth, right? Um, as, as a continent. Um, and, you know, uh, David Ajay actually did one of the most fantastic works on research projects on, on Africa, his book, um, Ajay Africa Architecture, where he, he looks at the entire continent without any kind of political borders, but looks at the, the cultural and climactic um, regions of, of, the, of the continent and think, look at the, the traditional and contemporary architectures that come out of that in response to those cultural and climactic um, conditions, right? Um, and how I position myself in that is that hip hop is one of the most authentically American products, right? And it's a product of this hybrid condition that is these African slaves coming to this continent, having to deal with all these different things, all the, the realities of oppression and of of, of housing, public housing and public schools and prisons and, and all of that, like it's all wrapped up in hip hop culture. So hip hop is, is this, 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 this very, very American thing that has in its, in, in its bones, it has the seeds of, 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 an, of an artistic expression that is very, very singular. 
And that's what I'm tapping into with, with hip hop architecture. Um, that's not just something that we're looking at replicating European models in a very good way for Black communities or replicating an image of what we think Africa should look like and bringing it to, to, to the United States. But we're actually taking the things that are already embedded within our culture and expressing them architecturally. Okay. All right, Marcy, I think you get the last question. And you're still muted. Muted. You're still muted, Marcy. Now you get to hear all the bells and whistles. Ah, I lost my image. What did I do? There you go. Um, you know, this has really been, um, you know, one of these moments where you see things come together. And I really appreciate the, the depth and length you've gone through to talk about what you're doing and how that work really is, is opening up all sorts of doors and ideas and lights coming in and just the whole notion that it, it reaffirms the power of the dream in a way, you know, and the imagination and how powerful it, it is to, when you grow up with uh, walls of respect, for example, in Chicago, um, as, as a kid and as you travel throughout in, uh, the country, you don't even have to do the world, you realize what was going on there in relation to other spaces and places. And so you learn about uh, wall, you know, murals coming out of Mexico. You begin to look at resistance and, and how to negotiate in communities so that you could put your, your graffiti up uh, and who you can't negotiate with. And then next stage, and that this whole notion of intergenerational um, is a vibe. It's not old school old generational where when I was a young woman, we didn't do that. It was more like, also, this is what we did. This is what we thought. This is what was happening. And so the groove itself, and you begin to look, I do a lot of work in Chicago and Ben Caldwell is, you know, has a commitment to Sankofa City and the imagination and how to deal with uh, uh, rebuilding uh, the, the inner city. And that that rebuilding and architecture is on the tongues of so many people suddenly is it's you feel as though we can do this and it's so inspirational and um, I think that's what we appreciate most at least I appreciate most about your presentation because isn't it's not just you you know there's a whole crew of people who are like going for the same kinds of ideas. Yep. That, you, you, that you can tap into, that you can talk to, belong and, and um, you know, um, grow and in trying not to use too many uh, hip hop expressions and phrases, but I think really, um, um, we really appreciate uh, spending this early afternoon and hopefully we'll have time for more uh, discussions throughout the semester and opportunities. Uh, so um, I wasn't told that I would be closing out anything <laughs> up on anyone's uh, 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 foot here, but um, just, you know, for me uh, and uh, Hari and proud Nas fellows, you know, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for an exciting and thrilling start to our colloquium series. I think there's going to be a run at the bookstore for your book. I hope they're well stocked. I hope so. <laughs> and we look forward to um, following your projects, the ones you've kind of suggested during your talk and, and others as they continue. Um, I think um, both Kate and Michael have their hands up. Is that true? Or is it Jim? No, they were they were applauding, I think. Oh, I said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Jim, please stay in touch. I know you're not in the vicinity, but um, you know, we'll see you online. And perhaps in the spring, you'll come up for a few visits. Yes, in the spring, for sure. <laughs>